Well, I should probably start in the time on the fashion by introducing myself. My name's Henrik Kirchner, and I'm a security and risk consultant by trade. I've been for the last 15 years or so since I left the army. While I was in the army, in which I was fortunate enough to spend 25 years, I was the exact opposite of a security professional. And one of the first things I did after I left the army was I spent three years as an IT director. So I've been both sides of the fence. What I propose to do tonight is to take a very quick gallop through some of the basic context of information security, because I mean, you guys are all pretty much hip to those. But then start thinking and talking a bit more about how you actually go about quantifying the value of the investments you make in information security, how you go about actually defining the level of investment you want, and how you go about defining what it is you actually need to do with a quick divergence into, is it a technology issue? Well, no, it's not. It's people, it's process, and it's only distant technology. What I hope to do is get through all that in about half an hour, which then gives us time to have a bit of an argument. I'm going to be saying some heretical stuff, I hope. I'm going to annoy some people, I hope. But essentially, my thesis is that the industry has been lying to people, people have been lying to themselves, and while things aren't broken, we could be doing things a lot better, a lot more cheaply, and a lot more effectively. And I'm just suggesting an approach that might take us in that direction. So if you want, that's the takeaway from tonight. If you want to shoot off and have a curry or something now, that's probably a good time. In terms of tonight, I think it's fantastic that this is being organized by the British Computer Society, and I'd just like to put in a completely unprompted plug for the BCS. Who here is a member already? Ah, so there's a number of people that actually ought to look into joining. It's a fantastic institution, but it's only as good as the people in it. And the more people we can get in it, and the more people we can get in it from all sorts of different backgrounds, the more we can make it relevant and active here in the 21st century. You're very, very fortunate here in Plymouth, and you've got a very, very strong local BCS contingent, and I would strongly urge everyone to support it. And if you're not a member, look at joining. So, without any apology whatsoever for the context, just so we, we're all starting from the same set of assumptions. First assumption is that the information space in which we're embedded, call it cyberspace, call it the internet, call it whatever it is, but anyway, the information fabric within which we operate and upon which our economy depends absolutely, is not a benign place. It hasn't been a benign place for years and it's becoming increasingly less benign. The reason why that is, is because the number of threat actors out there is increasing. They're increasing both in terms of capability and an intent. So a problem that years ago was essentially to do with hackers in mum's basement has since become professionalized. So at the higher end, you've got state actors. Other nations are available, but you know, un units based in Shanghai come to mind. Units based in uh, the Lubyanka come to mind. You have quasi-state actors or tolerated actors, those operating on behalf of a nation state with at least the toleration, sometimes the active support of that nation state without official support. You have non-state actors that have political or single issue drivers behind them. And you have criminals, as well as you know, traditional hackers. <coughs> criminals are a growth industry because crime is smart. And generally speaking, the people you find in prison are the, the, are the dumb criminals. The good criminals are the ones you don't find in prison and the ones making a living. It stands to reason, as the economy has moved increasingly online, and as human activity has become, critical human activity has begun to occur in, in, in the information space, and real world economic transactions are happening in the information space, that's immediately made it a point of some interest to crime. And beyond sort of fraud and embezzlement, theft of, theft of intellectual property, things like ransomware have become a problem. And what's interesting is that that's a problem not just for large corporations, it's a problem for individuals. I'm sure we've all heard of the cases of people waking up one morning and discovering that their machine is telling them all your files have been, been encrypted. Send us $25 or five bitcoins or whatever and we'll unencrypt your files. That's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. And it strikes at people directly where they live. <coughs> a, number of, a number of people in a very unsophisticated fashion have almost their entire lives archived out there out there on the internet. 
some very precious and valuable information is out there. You know, stuff that perhaps we wouldn't worry about over much, but you know, if you've got all your family photographs digitized and you lose them, that's a big deal. So crime is pervasive. And it's becoming more pervasive because there's what I've often called the democratization of the IT security threat. As the techniques and the methods and the tools become more widely available, as they become downloadable from black sites, as they become rentable from criminal organizations, more and more and more people are in a position to start using these tools and these techniques. And as we all know, it's very hard to attribute an attack. It's very hard to actually mount a prosecution, a successful prosecution of an attack. And it's damn near impossible if an attack starts in a jurisdiction which doesn't take these things seriously. <coughs> Therefore, there is little point in looking for assistance from government or from law enforcement. And to a great extent, people have pushed back on their own resources, which is where you know, we in the IT security trade come in. Our job is not just to protect governments and large enterprises, it's also to help protect the individual. And I view with delight the fact that increasingly IT security professionals are putting a lot of effort into schemes and support for individuals and for families and for individual users and punters. And I think we need to do a lot more of that. As part of the context as well, This has now become a political issue. As you know, there is a disconnect between you know, what, po what politics finds interesting and what's actually true. IT security has become a political issue. Cybersecurity of the national, the national information space has become a political issue. Cybersecurity generally is a political issue, and a lot of effort is going in all through the West, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, all over the EU, friendly nations in the Middle East are all spending an awful lot of money on cybersecurity in order to secure the, the critical national infrastructure. That's to say, not just the nuts and bolts of government, but those key important economic facilities such as you know, power, gas, distribution, logistics, banking and finance, telecommunications, all the things which actually make a modern society and modern economy work are now becoming the subject of government attention and well-meaning government support and well-meaning government advice. It's very welcome in the case of some of the utilities who perhaps arguably are a little bit behind the curve. It's perhaps less welcome for the major financial institutions, most of which are, have pretty much got all their stuff in one sock anyway. On top of this, on top of that governmental interest in securing the critical national infrastructure, <coughs> there's increasingly governmental interest <coughs> in securing the individual citizen. And the reason for that is quite practical. It is cheaper for the citizen to interact with his government online than it is through call centers or through the post. It's easier and more effective for the government to respond to the citizen. There is increasingly an expectation on the part of the citizen in the West, at least, that his government be there as a service provider to him. There is increasingly an expectation that government should respond quickly to the concerns of the citizenry. And that means that there has to be a quite, quite sophisticated communications fabric between the citizen and government, they should be embedded in the same fabric. <coughs> and for a great example of that, look at Estonia, which has fantastic online services, tremendous richness and wealth of services available to the citizen, and until relatively recently, huge vulnerability. And when the Estonians in 2008, was it, decided they were going to move a statue of a Soviet soldier from the town square in Tallinn, to a sculpture park on the outskirts of town because the Estonians didn't actually see very much to celebrate in the, in the Soviet army. If I tell you that the, the Estonian, the translation of the Estonian term for this statue was a, the, 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 the memorial to the unknown rapist, that gives you some insight into how they felt. So they moved this and the youth organization of Yedina Rasia, which is the ruling party in Russia, an outfit called Nashi, decided this was a terrible thing and they mounted a denial of service attack on the entire national infrastructure. They took down pretty much every Estonian government we website. This is a major disruption and it pointed the way ahead. Because Nashi are not an official organization. Yeah, they're the youth wing of the party, the ruling party. They were not doing this with the sponsorship of the KGB or the FSB. They were not doing this with the sponsorship overtly of the Russian government. They were in a position to really badly impact 
a national government, albeit with a small country. <coughs> a straw in the wind. So that's the context. It's, it's, it, it's bad out there and it's getting worse. So how do we respond to it? Well, there are two sets of responses that we can note. The first is the response from the user, from the operator, from you know, the guy whose IT systems are under attack, whether it's a government, whether it's an enterprise, whether you know, it's a charity, whether it's Mrs. Miggins down the road. And the first thing is flatly to deny it, pretend it's not happening. Because it's all terribly scary, and this is scary. Because the problem is that it's seen as being a technical issue. It's seen as being something that's incredibly clever and it's to do with the IT. And a lot of people still, in this year of our Lord 2015, find the concept of IT frightening. And especially people who have made it to the top of organizations and this tends to be the case in government, and it, oddly, it's even the case in some large multinational companies, because IT has become professionalized, and because it's seen as being effectively a, a cost center, and because it's seen as being pivotal to what the organization does without necessarily being fully understood by everybody in the organization, anything that affects the stability or the integrity of the IT system is, by definition, terribly scary and unknown. It's an unknown quantity. Therefore, the immediate human response is to shut your eyes when it becomes apparent that it is a problem, <coughs> first response is to shoot, you know, identify the guilty and shoot the innocent. Second response is to throw money at it. And vendors don't help themselves here, and we'll come on to vendors. But throwing money at a problem is great. And it's better than not throwing money at a problem, of course it is. But it's not necessarily a particularly good use of the money. And an expectation that there's a single silver bullet that will solve all your problems is naive in the extreme. And a lot of spend on IT security over the years has been done by people who believed that there was a silver bullet and who basically got held upside down and their pockets turned out. There is a problem with finding reputable sources of advice. There are very few objective observers out there, whether they're in academia, whether they're in commerce, whether in the big consultancies, whether in government. There are any number of people that you can turn to for advice, and a confused chief executive can find as much advice out there on the web or you know, through his consultants as he, could, as he could usefully want. He has no way of knowing what's reliable and what's not. He has no way of knowing who's talking nonsense and who's not. And I think that's a problem. If you're a lawyer and you give bad advice, you're liable for that bad advice. If you're an accountant and you sign off somebody's accounts and they turn out to be crook, then you're in trouble. We have a problem still with the ability both to generate objectively useful advice and to have it certified as being both objective and useful and straightforward and reliable and accurate. Having decided what your priorities are, having gone through the risk management process, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, you've then got somehow to justify an investment. Having established what it is you want to do, the end state you want to achieve, and having roughed out in your mind, okay, this is the size and shape of the program I need to move from state A, which is where I am, to state B, which is where I want to be, and how we cross the delta is through this program plan, you've then got to find some way of justifying that investment. And that's very hard, because what you're doing is you're proving a negative. A security investment is by definition a grudge purchase. Nobody wants to spend money on security. It's very hard to put a number on it. And it's usually the first thing to slash in the budget, normally first thing after marketing. So it's very, very, very hard indeed to monetize or to quantify the benefits of a security investment. And we'll talk a little bit about a possible route through that using the risk model as a way of justifying the investment, as a way of costing the investment and the value of, the invest and the value of it. And the other problem, of course, is IT security, information security, cyber security, if you like, is seen as being a ding an sich, a separate thing to the wider risk and security context of the organization. All organizations manage their risks. All organizations have at least part of their risks very, very firmly understood. Generally speaking, these are the financial and commercial risks if you're a commercial enterprise, reputational risks if you're an academic enterprise, and political risks if you're a political enterprise, but generally speaking, your core activity you understand, and generally speaking, your governing, your governing entity, whether it be your board or your chief executive or your prime minister, <coughs> uh, 
understands the risks he owns. He doesn't necessarily understand the fact he owns all the risks and that all risks should be treated the same. That a risk is a risk is a risk is a risk. And if you're using separate approaches to physical security risks, to those you use for IT security risks, if you're using separate approaches to the assessment of threats for physical threats as opposed to IT threats, stuff is going to fall through the gaps. If you have separate people in charge of these organizations without any way of joining them up, stuff will definitely fall through the gaps. So that's, that's the, the response by the operators. Industry response has been disappointing. I can trust you, I can trust you all, can't I? Okay, we'll declare a table NDA because I'm gonna be unemployed from Friday anyway because I'm in the process of leaving my company. I shall deny ever having said this, though the video record might be a bit difficult to overcome. <coughs> We've been talking bollocks for years in industry. We've been selling through fear, and we've been ramping up uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And we've been suggesting that there is a silver bullet. And whoever you are as a vendor, you've got your, your particular thing, you know, your particular box, your particular application, your particular approach, your particular methodology, and it's the silver bullet. This will make all your problems go away. And in fact, here's our solution. Does it sort of fit any of your problems? It's inherent in the nature of the beast. That's what commercial entities do. They deliver products and they want to sell a product. The problem is, and this harks back to the bit about good advice, nobody has a set of problems that are addressable by one product, or one application, or one approach. Everybody has complex problems, everybody has unique problems, and everybody has things that need to be addressed, generally speaking, by best of breed. Some of the big, some of the big consultancies get this especially where they've decoupled themselves from the product's end. And they will do your job. You'll pay, you'll char you'll, you'll, you'll pay the earth for that job, and you'll find yourself constrained in their straitjacket in terms of the way they like to do business. You'll find yourself governed by the SLA that they give you. You'll find yourself running according to the contract that they propose to you. But you'll have a degree of, a degree of assurance that, however uncomfortable that is, it'll kind of work. What it won't do is it won't necessarily accommodate things that you want to do that are different. It won't necessarily suit the way you want to do business. And that, to my mind, is a problem. And I think that the industry could be doing a lot more to help people. And the industry should understand that this security stuff is vital and it's important, but it mustn't get in the way. The whole point of IT and the whole point of the information infrastructure upon which we depend is for us to be able to do things with it. And while protecting it is very important, and while doing all this other good stuff is fantastic, it mustn't get in the way. Because if it does get in the way, it will be actively subverted. And we all understand that the single most profound threat to any organization is the insider threat. And this needn't be malicious. It can be accidental, it can be negligent, or it can be frustration that brings it on. Please do. It's all right. You, we'll, you won't have to do the first hundred questions on the test. <laughs> and the difficulty, of course, is that if you're a technology vendor, generally speaking, you will, you will see all, all the answers to all the problems as being technology, technology answers. If you're a process vendor, you know, a specialist in procedures, then you will see all those questions, all, all, all those issues in, those, in that context. The old, the old story, if, you know, if all you've got is a hammer, Every problem looks like a nail. And I think that we've become accustomed to the idea that it's a technology problem. It's not a technology problem at all. Technology is the easy stuff. Technology, if properly deployed and properly minded and properly um, administered, will just work. And provide you perform routine network hygiene, provide you do your systems administration, provide you run your patching regime properly, provided you manage user privilege and account control, provide you do all that other good stuff, which is not special, it's just what sysadmin sys should be doing anyway, 90% of the problems will not happen. Because most attacks depend upon negligence and depend upon stupid mistakes being made by the system administrator. The other thing we do is we tend not to make 
proper sensible threat assessments. We took, we're going to talk about threat assessments in a little bit, but generally speaking, an organisation will normally have a pretty good idea of what the threat context is in terms of physical security. So if, you, if for example, you're an animal research organisation, as you might be hunting in life sciences or somebody, you're going to be keenly aware that there are people out there that are not interested in your physical welfare. Be keenly aware of the fact they're willing to use any number of tactics to uh, upset your business, up to and including, you know, harassing your staff and direct attack on your property. So, you know, you understand both the capability and the intent of your opponent. I don't think that's the case in IT security, and I don't think that, that necessarily people have understood particularly how to go about both gathering and interpreting that intelligence in order to inform their threat assessments. I think there's an unclear idea of the actual impacts of an information security event, a negative event. I don't think people understand impact nearly well enough, and I don't think they understand the implications in terms of the reputational impact, in terms of the commercial impact, in terms of the operational impact, in terms of the actual financial impact of what could otherwise be a trivial event. They don't necessarily understand the fact that nowadays an organisation is embedded in a very complex risk context. Any enterprise depends upon a number of upstream and downstream links, not all of which it has any visibility over. So, for example, you're in a business, an old-style manufacturing business, and you have a very straightforward business model. People in country A dig up, you know, um, item A. Item A moves into your factory, you work your magic on it, and it comes out as product B, and you sell product B in the market. That's fine. And you only really then have to worry about one upstream, one downstream link. You have to worry about your customer, make sure that he's okay so he can carry on buying your product. You have to keep an eye on your supply and make sure that he's continuing to deliver your supplies. And you have to look after your own organisation. Writ larger, the average organisation nowadays has a huge network of interdependencies, which is complicated by the fact, of course, a lot of people are no longer doing things themselves. A lot of people outsource the sort of support activities. And they depend upon other entities, not necessarily visible to them. For example, if you are dependent upon supply of raw material, that supplier may well have outsourced his IT security to a third party. You'll have no visibility of that, you'll have no communications with that third party, and you'll have no way of influencing the risk management of your upstream supplier. <coughs> so I don't think people understand the risk context nearly enough. And I think that the sort of hits and hysteria we get every now and then as you know, a major event happens, you know, the Sony hack or you know, the Target hack in the United States or the Estonian affair, sort of hysteria, the Daily Mail style hysteria, oh my god, they're going to they're, they're come, they're going to smash your computer and they're, they, they, they're, they're going to steal your children, what's going to do to house prices? That's not helpful. There is a, there is a way of conveying the nature of, and the scope and the scale of the threat in a non-hysterical fashion. Now, government's not traditionally very good at that, and I put it to you that, you know, to be heretical again for a minute, more people have died in accidents involving domestic irons in the last five years in the UK than as a result of terrorism. And strategic impact and strategic shock are often mistaken for media impact and media shock. And I think we, we should be very, very careful about hysteria. We should be very, very careful about HETs because this is a problem. And I'm, I've just spent quite some time t talking about it being a problem. But it's not an insoluble problem. A lot of the answers to the questions we're raising today are very simple. And they're to do with just, you know, doing what you're meant to do. We talked about threat. And the knowledge of threat and the understanding of threat and the appreciation of the level of threat to which you are subject. Strictly speaking, the, the dictionary de or the, the risk management mafia definition of a threat is anything which is of human agency with malicious intent which produces a negative impact. We also talk about hazards, which are things which are either of natural agency or through accidental negligent human impact, but we'll just talk about threats. Any threat has three variables that you need, to, you need to assess in order to find out what it is in terms of a risk. First is the impact of that negative, effect, that negative event. You know, what actually will happen if this happens? What's the worst case? 
Second is the likelihood. You know, how likely is it this is going to happen? And the third, of course, is the value of the asset. In terms of the threat actors, because that's what it all comes down to, because in order for this negative event to happen, somebody will have to have done something to you. You need to understand their capability, you know, what can they do, and their intent. You know, what do they want to do? <coughs> because they don't, you know, pe pe there are as many mi different motivations for attacks as there are attackers out there. And the motivations, the reasons for the attack vary, as does the desired impact of the attack. Because an attack is not necessarily just trashing your system. An attack might be abstracting intellectual property. It might be thieving the designs of your latest jet aircraft. It might be imposing ransomware. It might be simply installing a bunch of malware, which at some point will do its thing, which at some point will penetrate your perimeter, and at some point will send privileged information in an unauthorized fashion across your corporate firewall or across your corporate boundary to gain advantage at your, at, at, at your cost. There's any number of different things that the attacker might want to do. And there's any number of different end states he might want to achieve. And while you won't necessarily be able to, you won't be able to sit down and sort of work out for yourself, well, this, this guy sat in his mum's basement in Kharkov has got this intent and you know, he wants to create this end state. But you, you will be able to understand the sort of people that are going to have a problem with you sort of people are going to have a problem with your organization. You can understand the sort of impacts that they're going to want to try to generate. And there are commercial intelligence services out there that you can sort of get a, a, a head start through. There are people out there who actually make a living doing good, straightforward threat intelligence. And if you run a large organization, I always tell people I recommend that you look at buying this. But being aware that you know what you're getting is raw intelligence. It still has to be interpreted and you still have to understand it. Having established what your threat context is, having listed all the bad things that can happen, you can then move to the next stage, which is actually risk assessment. <coughs> and a risk is a threat which has been factored, been, been analysed both for impact and likelihood, and the impact and likelihood factored together in order to produce a risk rating. At this point, we start things start to get confusing because there are some classic risk management techniques which can be used where there is a great deal of statistical data. So weather risk, there's a huge amount of statistical data. Industrial risk, safety risk, huge amount of statistical data. So you can actually apply statistical techniques and you can actually come up with some fairly hard numbers, both for impact and likelihood. <coughs> this is not yet the case in cybersecurity or in information security or in IA or whatever you want to call it. Because there is not that body of data and because people are understandably reluctant to share their data, you can't apply proper statistical modeling techniques. So to a great extent, risk assessment is still very much more art than science. So when you assess, both, when you assess impact, you can, be pretty, you can be pretty good because you understand your own organization, you understand the bad stuff that can happen to your own organization. Likelihood, it's a guess, it's a best guess. And if it's an educated guess, an informed guess, it's still better than nothing. <coughs> I always caution people though against putting numbers on these. Putting numbers on these, you know, well, you know, I think the likelihood is 6.2 and I think the impact's going to be 10, so therefore it's a 62 point risk factor. That gives a false impression of precision and starts to give people the idea that this is a precise art or precise science and it's not. At the moment, it's still an art. So, what I always recommend to people is use red, amber, green. Some sort of simple traffic light system so that, you know, you categorize your risk quite crudely into the things you must address, things you ought to address, and things you may address. And the must-haves, will, will, they will leap off the page at you. Because once you've assessed all your risks, once you've actually got your list of raw risks, <coughs> you have what ISO 31000 would have us call the raw risk register. And the raw risk register will then give you the opportunity to start thinking about mitigation. The raw risk register will have, in order, from the most pressing to the least pressing, all your risks. You then have two things to do. The first thing is you have to, in conjunction with your leadership, with the, with the enterprise, work out what is, the, what is your risk appetite. What is the level of risk below which you're content not to bother? Because, you know, most organizations, if it's, you know, $1,000 or $10,000 or $100,000, well, you know, the cost protection is likely to be more than that. So you can either put a cash 
ceiling on your, your risk appetite, you can find some other way of defining it, but it's important that you understand your, what your risk appetite is, because the next stage is you then apply your mitigation. Then go through the risk register, take each risk in turn, and you examine them, and you look at what you can do to reduce both the impact and the likelihood, ideally both, but one or the other will do, to a level that brings it down below your risk appetite. Now, the mitigation can be applied in a number of ways. You can do things. You can actually apply active measures. You can export it. You can insure it, or you can get a third party in and give that third party a contractual responsibility to manage that risk for you. Or you can ignore it. That's perfectly, it's perfectly reasonable to ignore or neglect a risk, provided you have assessed it. The point to bear in mind, of course, is that if you export it or if you ignore it, you don't stop owning that risk. The risk remains your responsibility. Once you've done all this mitigation stuff and once you've got your mitigation in place or you understand what it is you want to mitigate, that then becomes the basis for your mitigation plan, your program plan. But also what you're left with then is the res residual risk register. And re the residual risk register will demonstrate that you know, you've mitigated all the must-haves. You've done most of the ought-tos and you may even have done a couple of the can-dos. And that's then a live document, because this is not a process that happens once. This is a process that has to be rolling. Having started on this regime, you then have to maintain it in a cyclic fashion, because it doesn't go away. And a risk register is out of date the day it's published. So it's a constant rolling process. And it's a constant process of assessment and reassessment, because it's a hugely dynamic space out there. The threat is polymorphic, and the threat is constantly changing threat is constantly under evolution. And we as the operators will never have the, will never, ever, ever have the initiative. If you get hit with a zero day attack, you're stuffed, whatever happens. However, the chance of getting hit with a zero day attack are slim. The chance of good that somebody else is going to get hit with a zero day attack, in which case you need that intelligence because you need to be able to respond very quickly to what happened to him, make sure it doesn't happen to you. I always tell the story of the, the two guys in the tent in the jungle. And they're both sitting around, smoking and joking, just having a nice time. They hear the, the snarl of a tiger outside, the, outside the, the tent. And one guy very calmly starts putting his running shoes on. His mate says, well, I'm not going to outrun a tiger. No, I can outrun you, though. Because it is, it's a selfish business. You know, the principles of security, physical security, deflect, deter, deny, distract. So if you, if, if you can get somebody to attack somebody else, well, that's great from your perspective. I know it sounds selfish, but... And the more we talk to each other, and the more we share intelligence, and the more we can overcome this reluctance to share intelligence on cybersecurity events, the more likely we are to win back a little bit of that breathing space. Because even though we'll never have the initiative, even though the attacker will always have the first move, if you can reduce that window of vulnerability during which you are unprotected against a new attack or an unusual attack, you then reduce materially both the risk, both the impact and the likelihood of that, 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 that attack. So intelligence is one of the key words. Now none of this is clever, none of this is new stuff. All of this is absolutely routine, risk management 101. What hasn't happened to date and what must happen in the future is that you know, the enterprise, whether it be a university, whether it be government, whether it be a company, whatever it is, needs to start thinking about these things in the round. And some organizations already understand risk very well. Industrial organizations understand it extremely well. A lot of the utilities understand it extremely well. What they don't necessarily do is crunch that together with their information technology piece to come up with a, co a cohesive, coherent, robust risk management regime. And in order to be able to do that, there are some things we, we as a profession, and the wider we here, the IT profession, need to be better at. We need to be better at the whole language piece. Because at the moment there is sometimes a disconnect between the people who are the business decision makers and the people who have the control of the purse, and the people who are actually out there running the IT organizations, running the IT security organizations. Sometimes it's you know, linguistic based on vocabulary, Sometimes it's social, based on, you know, we're not that great at wearing ties a lot of the time. <laughs> and sometimes it's just straightforwardly that, you know, we find it very hard to articulate some of the technical concepts in a way that is meaningful 
to the people who are going to authorise an investment. So we have to get better. I always talk, refer to it as, you know, translating suit to t-shirt and t-shirt to suit. We have to get better at that. And it's up to us to get better at that, because we're the people who should be driving this. It's up to us to understand that it's not just technology. In fact, technology is easy. It's to do with people and with process. And on the people side, at the moment we get around people, we've got acceptable use policies. We have to get better at things like um, user behavior analysis. We have to get better at understanding what it is that people are doing with the network. We have to get better at understanding what normal looks like. In the, in the good old days in the army, we used to say that the key indicators and warnings are the presence of the unusual or the absence of the usual. The moment things are odd, the moment people start behaving differently, the moment individual network devices start behaving differently from the norm, is the moment you need to identify and the moment you need to respond. This implies a degree of oversight and degree of surveillance of activity on the network that a lot of people are going to be uncomfortable about, a lot of users are going to be uncomfortable about it, and I think a fair number of IT people are going to be uncomfortable about applying that level of surveillance. Some of it can be automated, some of it can be dealt with simply by excluding entire categories of action on the part of individuals. You know, if somebody has no particular need to be able to do something, then don't give them the permission. So grant permission rather than remove privilege. Start from a very, very, very low-level fascist uh, set of permissions and only gradually increment them out. This takes a lot of the fun and the creativity out of IT and takes a lot of the fun and the creativity out of the day-to-day -day work environment and has to be done very, very carefully because, of course, the IT environment, the information environment is there for people to do stuff with. It's not there for you to play security games with. It's there for people to do their business on. So there is a very delicate balance there to which we need to be more sensitive. Therefore, by extension, we need to be a lot closer to people like the HR. We need to be a lot closer to the people who are actually setting personnel policies. And it needs to be a proper dialogue, not a question of you know, HR signing off or HR impl imposing a policy. It's a question of a dialogue, you know, what is technically feasible, what is socially desirable, what is administratively possible, and come to that, what is legal? Because there are jurisdictions in the EU where that sort of level of overt surveillance of network activities would be illegal. <coughs> we, in the UK, can assert, as the owners of an information system, that everything on that information system is ours. And that's fine. Perfectly legal. In Germany, for example, you know, private communication is privileged. So what you have to do is you have then have to get very, very um, up yourself. And if you're running a German enterprise, you then have to say, well, no private communications are permissible on, on our corporate network, which then again starts bothering people because increasingly people have different expectations. I mean, I'm an old bugger. I've got no particular expectations. I'm 60 next year. You know, things like Instagram still catch me out. And I don't particularly feel the need to have social, social communications going at all times. I don't feel the need to be constantly embedded in a, in, a, in, in a fabric of communication with my friends and acquaintances. That is not the case with people, you know, below my age. And it's an entirely reasonable expectation on their part that they are used to being embedded in this fabric of communication. They are used to being in touch with perhaps hundreds of people at the same time on a constant basis. It's not a bad thing. It's a different challenge, that's all. It's just something else we have to understand how to secure. We can't ban it, because they're going to do it anyway. So what we have to do is we have to find some way of managing that in a way that delivers a win-win wherever possible for both sides of that equation. <coughs> the key question in generating a business case is putting some numbers on it, putting some money in. Because the way, the way we do stuff in the West is everything has a value. And the way we work out who's winning, who's losing is by who's got the most dollars. You know, whoever, whoever dies with most toys wins. But it's as good a way as any of indicating how an organization should emphasize its spend. Because everything costs money. And if you're a profit-making enterprise, anything you spend internally is money that's not going to the shareholder. So you have to find some other way of demonstrating that it's enhancing shareholder value. If you're an, in, if you're an industrial organization, anything you spend on processes not directly impacting your, your manufacture is affecting your bottom line. If you're a government, it's all public money and you know, it's, it's taxpayers' money. 
So, you know, there is, there, there is a reason why we put a dollar value on everything like this. We have to find some way of actually assigning a dollar value to an IT investment, an IT security investment. Now, historically speaking, what we've done is we've said, we've hand-waved, and we said, oh, well, you know, this, this will save millions, because if something bad happens, then it'll cost us millions. And, yeah, like that. To which the average chief executive sort of looked down his long aristocratic nose and said, yes... How many millions? How often is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Can you assure me that it's not going to happen now, or if it does happen, it's going to be less? No, to all of the above. So why then should we spend the money? So you have to find some other way. And the way to do it, actually, is to consult ISO 31000, which is you know the, the International Standard on Risk Management and Risk Assessment, which actually has a set of uh, metrics in there, which allow you to start putting some sort of dollar value on the value of the asset, the value of the protective measures, and start thinking about how you actually go about pricing the value of those protective measures, because it's not just a question of, you know, give me a million dollars and I'll sort, I'll sort it out. If you understand your own numbers well, you understand the capital cost element, which we've written down over how many years it is that your organization writes down a capital investment, say five years, so if it's a million dollars, then it's $200,000 a year. The operational cost component of it, say $50,000 a year, so nice round figures, for the next five years, we will be paying $250,000 a year. Okay, the asset is worth five hundred thousand dollars. It's an easy, it's an easy win. The likelihood of an attack is ten percent. Yeah, that doesn't really work. Ten percent per annum, fifty thousand dollars, twenty-five thousand dollars. No, okay, yeah, it kind of works. The likelihood of an attack is five percent. No, it doesn't work. So you actually need to work. You actually need to start thinking in those terms. You actually need to start generating your ideas in those terms. The technical aspects are key because the technical aspects allow you to first quantify the amount of investment required and secondly identify the cost or the value of the asset. But that's as far as that goes. That's as that, at that point it stops being technical and starts becoming a business decision and has to be cast in business terms because those are terms which are meaningful across the organisation. <coughs> and before we start before we start the sort of Q&A and the sort of discussions part, I can't stress enough this business of the integration of cyber risk management with wider risk management in the organization. Without that, without a coherent, cohesive, robust and dynamic approach to what is a robust and dynamic threat environment, we're all going to be stuffed. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much.